This is CBC Here and Now. Crew members on board this offshore vessel worry about American colleagues joining them without being required to isolate for 14 days. This year it's a ghost town. For this year it's, it's a, it's a write-off. This is usually a busy time of year for Gross Morn, but COVID has all but halted the tourism season. After a long wait, the Cape Hunter finally rolling at Middle Cove Beach. Yeah, it's really fun. They're slippery and they wiggle around. I never tried it before, but I think I'm going to like it. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Eaton, and I'll show you some of the sights and the sounds coming up on Here and Now. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. Another new case of COVID-19 tonight. A close contact of yesterday's new case has also contracted the virus. They're in the same family. Health officials say the risk to the public is low and the family is speaking out on a Facebook post. Peter Cowan is here now with the details. So Peter, what is the family saying? Yeah, the family's asking not to be named, but the mother posted on Facebook to say it's her young toddler who has now tested positive. This comes after her spouse was the case that we announced yesterday, uh, the girl's father. And they've been receiving quite a bit of backlash on social media, so the mother wanted to put out this post. And I'll read you a little bit about uh, what she said in her post. Uh, she wrote to say, we have been informed by several health officials that we did nothing wrong and did... Um, and are continuing to do everything the way we should. Anyone who knows us knows how cautious we have been. Just we were the unlucky ones in a situation and we are trying to cope with this scary situation as much as we can. Thanks again to everyone who has been there for us when we need it most. And that message of needing to support people is one that we heard today from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, said that posting comments about criticism for people who test positive is just not helpful. As people test positive, they must feel supported and be treated with this same kindness. As many can relate, testing positive for any illness can be scary for both the person and their family members, COVID-19 is, is no different. Put yourself in their shoes before you decide to make a comment on social media and ask yourself, what would I want someone to say to me if I was in this situation? Dr. Fitzgerald said the risk to the public remains low. Everyone has been isolated and they're continuing to test any close contacts uh, from this new case. Uh, but we've now seen that the personal care home in Glovertown has announced it is closing its doors to visitors. And here's part of the post that they made on Facebook today. Our residents and staff have not been exposed as far as we know. However, because we live in a small town, we need to keep our residents safe. We prefer to be overcautious to ensure everyone's safety. But is that really necessary? Well, the Chief Medical Officer of Health says no. In fact, no one from the home consulted health officials and her recommendation would be there's no reason to close visitation. Uh, at the moment, the risk to the community is low. Um, the people involved are quarantined or isolating. And uh, so at, at this point, we would not advise and East, uh, sorry, Central Health uh, will be reaching out to uh, the personal care home question this afternoon to discuss. If you're wondering about the risk to a young toddler getting the disease, the good news here is so far the research has shown that young children generally present more milder symptoms and are at lower risk for serious complications. Carolyn? So much, Peter. That's here and now's Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, the crew of an offshore supply vessel in St. John's has major concerns about a group of Americans joining its crew. This comes after the province granted an exemption to the workers, removing the need to self-isolate upon arrival in the province. Here and now's Ryan Cook has more. The Maersk Nexus is busy today guiding the Terra Nova to shore, but next month the ship will be heading to Quebec for repairs and will have four members of a Texas-based company joining along for the journey. Texas is rivaled only by Florida when it comes to the surge of COVID-19 in the United States. 
Maersk has an extensive COVID-19 rulebook that governs what employees can do both on and off the ship, but a crew member that I spoke with said that that policy doesn't mean anything if they allow Americans to join the ship without self-isolating first. He says that members of the crew have fought back against the plan, but it's going ahead regardless. In an email to CBC News, Maersk confirms that the plan is going ahead. It says the Americans will be tested before joining the ship, undergo daily temperature checks and use PPE. A similar issue arose in Charlottetown earlier this month when a health care worker came from outside the province. The person tested negative on arrival, but after seven days of working at a hospital, they developed symptoms and tested positive. The Nexus crew have one more major concern. There's going to be a shift change about halfway through the repair job in Quebec, and Maersk is applying for exemptions for all the crew coming back to St. John's, meaning none of them would have to self-isolate. Some crew members are concerned that that could be cause for a COVID-19 outbreak. Ryan Cook, CBC News, CBS. Well, the Premier said today that these American crew members are essential workers who are tested multiple times before interacting with others. These individuals are, are deemed essential workers by the federal government. They are tested before they leave the United States, and these essential workers are then tested again before entering their workplace here in our province. These are essential workers, and when they're not working, they are in self-isolation. And when they cannot physically distance themselves from others, they wear a mask, and even to the point where they do not eat meals with their colleagues. The Hibernia offshore oil production platform remains shut down as the investigation into a spill there continues. Meanwhile, a Memorial University seabird expert is questioning the spill reporting process. Here in Esmar Quinn reports. The oil company says the spill happened on Sunday. They were drilling a new well when production fluid spilled into the ocean. They say they're still investigating how much spilled, but they do say that earlier this week, a sheen was spotted 2.5 kilometers from the production facility. For a MUN expert on seabirds, it's an opportunity to renew his call for independent oversight of the oil industry. It would be nice if Envi Environment Canada was out there. They're being informed the same way that the CNLOPB is. So, you know, what's going to happen is going to depend on what ExxonMobil reports. The Hibernia Management and Development Company says it's taking a hard look at the incident, and the company says it reacted very quickly when the spill happened. Now, we were able to uh, detect that issue in a short manner, and we shut in production within a matter of minutes. Edwards says the investigation continues and the company will release more information as it becomes available. But Montevecchi questions if the industry should be reporting on itself, detailing how much fluid ended up in the water and if any wildlife was affected. I think we can do better. I think we can scale it up. We have a regulator because we don't think self-reporting is the best way to, to you know, in fact, uh, be vigilant about the environment. Hibernia officials say no workers were harmed during the incident. They also say there's no evidence that wildlife has been harmed either. They say they haven't determined when the Hibernia platform will resume production. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. And an update to that, just moments ago, Hibernia officials told CBC they're gradually restarting production. Well, now to news from the courts, a so-called right-hand man in a large drug operation was sentenced in court this afternoon. Thomas Brown received 44 months in prison for conspiracy to traffic cocaine. Justice Sandra Chater said he was an important part of a cocaine trafficking conspiracy that stretched to Toronto and Montreal. Brown was a courier for the drugs. On two occasions, police watched him drive to Montreal to buy large quantities of cocaine. Chater said today he has disassociated himself with his former contacts and said he is a good candidate for rehabilitation. Well, the usually booming communities in Grossmoor National Park are quiet this summer. Restaurants and some hotels are closed because of the pandemic travel restrictions. And some adventure tourism businesses have turned to staycationers to pay their bills. Your announced Colleen Connors has more. Say last year, if you walked down to the waterfront, down, down, uh, down by the water there, uh, you'd have 
a hundred people by the water, right? Like it's, it's a happening place. Uh, this year it's a ghost town. The popular Ocean View Hotel closed for 2020. Restaurants like Java Jack's closed. Shear's Out East Adventure Shop is pretty empty. He had to cancel all guided hiking tours to Western Brook Pond this summer because of Parks Canada's guidelines and the travel bans. <sighs> not great. I mean, there's there's not a lot, uh, not lot, not a lot anyone can do. I mean, uh, we're not the only ones hit. Everyone's experiencing experiencing the same thing. Shears is focusing on his 20-room hostel instead, complete with brand new rooms, homemade quilts. That arm of the business is just focused on getting people to the national park uh, on a budget, right? You can't, uh, can't afford a $200 cabin, instead just get a $30 dorm room. Tonight, three rooms occupied. He decided to keep his hostel and storefront open to encourage provincial travel. Newfoundlanders tend to make, five, make up 5% of our business on, on a regular year. Um, staycation's helping, so that 5 has probably been doubled, maybe even tripled but that's still only 15% of a regular year. Down the road, a group from St. John's rent kayaks. This adventure company marketed the marine tours to staycationers, and it's working. I think we weren't like expecting to be this busy, so you know we're a little bit understaffed at the moment. We're all you know working a few extra hours, we'll say, to, to make it happen and provide that experience uh, for people and you know from all over the province. The company offer kayak and paddleboard rentals and Zodiac tours, all with COVID-19 safety measures in place. Well, this year with our marine adventures, we have uh, this beachfront property in Norris Point. We're so fortunate that we do. So most of our adventures are outdoors and we're only indoors really for our cafe that we run. Although the waterfront looks busy, the company's larger moneymaker, the week-long guided tour packages with food and accommodations, well, that isn't running at all this season. Because, uh, you know, that clientele is uh, from outside the province, outside of the Atlantic bubble. Uh, we're not seeing any of that business uh, so far this year. Some of the bigger clients from the United States and Ontario rebooked for 2021. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Norris Point. A painting by a Mi'kmaq artist in this province will be added to the permanent collection at the Smithsonian, one of the world's largest museum complexes that includes the National Museum of the American Indian. Nelson White is originally from Flat Bay but now lives in St. John's. He built a wooden box for his painting and now it's en route to the United States. The painting is a painting of a, an, um, an elder named Ellsworth Oakley. Uh, Mr. Oakley is a father of a good friend of mine who lives in Eskazonia, Nova Scotia, and he served with uh, the Airborne Division in the Korean War and is now, uh, now a veteran. Elder Oakley's face is just expressive and uh, has character, has lines. Um, also, I wanted to do something that acknowledged and paid tribute to uh, the numerous Indigenous people that served in the Armed Forces, served in the military and served in the police forces. There's a long history of Indigenous, indigenous service. I contacted the Smithsonian just kind of out of blue and said, hey, and they immediately came back to me and sort of said, yes, we're interested. And I had to put together a proposal as well as uh, pretty well a large application for their acquisitions committee. The Smithsonian has a number of different galleries. Uh, it's, it's in the Museum of the Native American Indian. Uh, so it's going to be either in Washington or New York. It's going to their facility in, in outside of Washington right now. and then. As needed, it'll be displayed either in either of those galleries based on theme or whatever they're working with. It's flattering for to be in the Smithsonian. It's exciting and it's important for me for my artwork to have a good home. And to have it in Smithsonian is the best home I can think of it because um, Elder Ellsworth now reaches an international audience. Now in Canada, I saw a big change when I came. I began to feel a lot more comfortable in my skin. Still ahead tonight, the challenges of buying makeup in this province for women of color. Three of them share their experiences with two local filmmakers.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Time now for a look at the weather forecast and it was another day in paradise for most of the province today. Just have a look at the highs today. A little bit cooler in western Labrador at 17 degrees, but uh, the rest of the province looking pretty warm today. Some hot temperatures in Deer Lake, Gander, St. John's got up to 25 degrees today with lots of sunshine. Overnight tonight we're looking at some showers pushing through Labrador. Clear skies for the entire island overnight this evening. Uh, winds fairly strong strong though in the east, the southwesterly gusting up to 50, similar to what we saw today. Clear skies, 15 degrees as the overnight low for St. John's. For Grand Falls, looking at 13 and 10 degrees in Corner Brook there with a southwesterly wind gusting up to 40 there. For Labrador, looking at a chance of some uh, thunder showers for the Cartwright area tonight, 14 degrees as the overnight low there and uh, some high winds for the Nain area 30 gusting uh, to 60 there overnight tonight and Labrador City looking at uh, a chance of some showers and 10 as the overnight low. So looking ahead to tomorrow, uh, some cloud cover moving in across the island uh, throughout the day, some showers for Lab West you can see there and also a chance of some showers pushing through later in the day for the south coast of the island. But looking at a really nice day once again for the east, 25 degrees for St. John's, a bit cooler along the coast at 18 degrees in the Placentia area. Uh, Marystown, 24 degrees, Clarenville, 25. So it is cooling down a little bit. That heat warning that's been in place for central and the northeast is now over. So it's still going to stay pretty warm there. Grand Falls winds are looking at 25 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. Harbor Breton could see those late afternoon showers and 19 degrees there. For the west coast, uh, chance of showers in the afternoon as well for Port of Basque, 19 degrees. Some cloudy skies moving in in Corner Brook, 26 there. So a nice hot, humid day coming for the Corner Brook area. Along the Straits, looking nice and clear for Lancelou. A chance of some showers for Mary's Harbor and for Cartwright uh, throughout the day. And for the rest of Labrador, looking at temperatures in the mid-20s uh, for Happy Valley Goose Bay with lots of sunshine there. But other areas in Labrador could see those showers throughout the day as as well 21 degrees as the high there so looking ahead to Friday it gets a bit messy for the eastern portion of the island you can see this rain coming through early in the morning on Friday that's 8 a.m. so it looks like some heavy rain for the Avalon Peninsula there and some rain moving in for uh, Lab City uh, throughout the day on Friday so looking at uh, some showers there in St. John's on Friday 15 degrees as the high there clearing off though for Grand Falls Windsor and Gander uh, temperature staying nice and warm there 23 degrees corner book brook looking at uh, uh, sun and cloud and uh, port of Basque getting those showers there on friday as well so and there's the chance of showers for parts of labrador staying really hot in happy valley goose bay at 26 degrees on friday so heading into the weekend now it's going to stay pretty wet in labrador on saturday and parts of the island looking at uh, a chance of some showers as well grand falls winds are heading up to 28 degrees uh, with some wet weather there mostly cloudy skies for the east on Saturday 20 degrees as the high 24 in Mary's town and uh, in Labrador cooling down in Nain 13 degrees there Lab City looking at those showers and 20 degrees so looking ahead to the long range Sunday a chance of some showers for the east and a cool down 19 degrees there on Monday don't know if I highlighted this a bit earlier actually 15 degrees on Friday so we are going to see quite a dip in temperatures in uh, the St. John's area on Friday with those showers moving through for central areas looking at uh, temperatures in the 20s uh, on Sunday and Monday with those showers moving in. So we do have some wet weather on the way to start off the week next week for the West as well. For Labrador, a uh, similar story with some wet weather coming on the weekend. Temperatures in the low 20s in the West and uh, similar story for the East with some showers on Monday and 19 degrees as the high. So here's a look at our weather photo of the day. This is taken in the Tablelands and this is Whistler the Husky and he looks like he's just really enjoying his day hiking the Tablelands. Thank you so much to Adam Cal for sending this uh, beauty of a pic in. And we have uh, one more photo to show you. We've been airing some home videos of people filleting cod lately, but this 
is a picture of four-year-old Jackson Savory showing off his fish that he helped his poppy catch off Rose Blanche on Monday. The fish, it's almost <laughs> as big as he is. Great catch. <laughs> Well, from big fish to little fish, it's been long overdue for folks patiently waiting for Capelin at Middle Cove Beach, but they finally showed up this morning. The Capelin spawn has been spotted elsewhere in the island and tonight should draw a massive crowd to the popular beach. Here and now's Jeremy Eaton stopped by to check out uh, some of the folks looking to catch a few Capelin. It's a beautiful sunny day in the city of St. John's and that day just got a whole lot brighter for some people who really love Capelin. They finally started rolling at Middle Cove Beach and while there are only a few people here now, they did not walk away empty handed. How long did it take to get all that bucket of Capelin? Uh, this is uh, maybe uh, half an hour. Yeah, there's many pieces. And what will you do with the Capelin? Uh, I'll make the, the dry. So I keep, I'll keep it stuck. Then we will eat. We'll make food and we'll eat. Yeah, it's really fun. It's enjoyable. And uh, are you catching them for yourself or are you catching them for other people? Other people and my family and friends and everybody. Mommy, I got them! Is the water nice and warm? No, it's cold. I my net's broken, so I'm just scooping some up, but I can't. They're getting too scared. They're freaking out. So, and I'm just trying to scoop them up, but I only get one at a time because they're so slippery. I enjoy them to eat. I get a great deal of use out of them. What I don't eat or salt, I'll put on my gardens. I also noticed that you're just filling up buckets for people who come up. Why did you want to do that? Why not? Doesn't cost a cent to be a nice guy. <laughs> and uh, how many times have you been out capelin fishing this year? Oh, I've been down here every night for the past 10 days, uh, waiting for them. My daughter just called and told me about the uh, Capelin meeting and stuff, right? So I've got to get a, pick up some for myself and for a few other people, so it's a good chance to, to grab. Well, we used to come down here years ago from Petty Harbour, and we used to come down in the night time and get Capelin to use for bait the next day to catch cod. So we'd slug buckets up go out the next morning and use them to catch cod for a living, right? So this is a little bit different. This is, this is coming down and getting some, getting a few to, to eat and a few to spread around with a few other people like that. It's a lot more enjoyable when you're retired. <laughs> My net. Yeah? Yeah, but at first it was kind of hard. <laughs> it was kind of hard? How yeah. long were you out catching capelin for? Uh, a long time. <laughs> a long time. Did you get a lot of capelin? Yeah. Um, it really looks like sand, but they're all connected with in a weird way, and they're not like little bits of rock, and that's what sand is, little bits of rock and other things. But these are just all the same material, so, I'm, so I can see why they're eggs. Oh, this is a monthly. How happy are you to see this site today? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. This evening will be crazy down here. It'll be. Oh, oh no, no, there'll be, there'll be 5,000 people here tonight. I think that store didn't carry makeup for our brown skin. So I used to, when I used to travel to India, I used to collect all those um, makeup, like even nail polishes. Coming up on Here and Now, we're exploring the challenges women of color experience when it comes to beauty products in this province.
For many women of color in our province, finding makeup can be a challenge. Peeking closer at the beauty industry in St. John's, filmmakers Prajwala Digshit and Jamie Miller sat down with three women and dug deeper to explore their shopping experiences. Here's their short doc, The Cost of Color. It's not common to find women of color as uh, sales associates or cosmeticians at stores in St. John's. It isn't easy to buy in St. John's because uh, the foundation or the concealer was I either too white for me or too dark for me. And like I wanted a brown based um, uh, makeup. This one is, makes me look really black. There's two different cultures here. People would, wouldn't mind wearing makeup every day. You could go to school wearing it or go to work every day. But whereas over there, you, you would only wear makeup once when you dressed up. I believe I was 16 when I first applied makeup to my face. And I really felt it was a trial and error, <laughs> even back then. I still remember hearing um, older aunties would say, oh, that girl is so fair and nice. Almost like to be lighter skinned was more acceptable, but it was subtle. I still felt people saw me as beautiful regardless of my skin tone. As I was growing up, even when I was a little child, I always heard this people saying that you are dark. And every time I hear, heard this word, you're dark, you're dark, you're dark, especially from my relatives, my aunts and uncles. They don't care if the man is dark or a bad character person or alcoholic, but all that matters for them is the woman has to be fair. That's all they care about. Well, it breaks something inside. I can't, I can't describe to you unless you are in my position. It breaks you from inside. Well, dark has many meanings, I would say, such as dark could also be used as where your complexion is a little bit more than a, like a light person would have, and dark would just be like, you would get tanned. And it's not a bad word. No, it's not at all. And then we, when we moved here, the first week I went to Costco, there was this lady behind me, didn't know why she was looking at me, and then she came over and she said, I hope you don't feel bad. I'm not being rude, but can I touch you? You're so gorgeous. And she said, where did you get this skin? You're so beautiful. You're so nice. You've got lovely hair. And she touched me. I was so, so happy. Now in Canada, I saw a big change when I came. I began to feel a lot more comfortable in my skin and a lot more proud of who I am. the right um, makeup because either it is too makes me too fair or either it makes me too dark I want the middle one so using one of the um, store-bought brands like Maybelline or CoverGirl it was always uh, mixing and using a darker powder which was still not dark enough so for me it was quite a challenge whenever I took pictures back then in the 80s and 90s my face always looked lighter than the rest of my skin. I went from store to store asking like for the right color and what they thought was right wasn't right for me. It's not that they didn't help me, they did help me, but they couldn't figure out. I think that store didn't carry makeup for our brown skin. So I used to, when I used to travel to India, I used to collect all those um, makeup, like even nail polishes and eyeliners and things like that, that uh, could get through me for a year. So I used to go to those shops in India and get them and stock them so that I don't have to go to the local stores. If you look at it a few, like 30 or 40 years back from now, whereas there wasn't much makeup, mm -hmm. um, you could have taken two colors and mixed them to get your skin tone right. I wouldn't say that is fair, but still, if you want to look for the makeup that suits your skin, then it's whatever you're going to do, right? I find the difference mainly uh, between being served by a woman of color versus a non-woman of color 
is that um, they would have gone through similar experiences and they would know more of your struggles and challenges whereas say a lighter skinned person may not have had the opportunity to try that product themselves so again you're going by a recommendation as opposed to an actual experience of the product itself i think um the store should uh, carry more products like foundations concealers eyeliners eyeshadows even for the press powder more of that matches our skin tone in terms of makeup in st john's what i would like to see is more sales associates and cosmetician of women of color because i really feel even um, though i've been here a long time um, i still think we have a little bit more work to do frankly speaking it does make me sad that we are here and we are adding to the economy but there's nothing for us here so it does make me feel sad but then i feel like well it's their country they may not be educated properly to know that there are different types of people too here women of color do want to look good they do want to look put together they do want to wear makeup makeup makes me feel happy whenever i put it on or like a party or an occasion Makeup makes me feel put together and a little more beautiful. So that's why I like to wear it when I go out. Makeup makes me feel very confident. And I look beautiful and I feel like the center of attraction wherever I go. It makes me happy. So there's a lot of musicians, uh, a couple actors, uh, politicians, a president, an actual president, which is cool. Yeah, you heard him. Mike Boyd once cooked for an American president. Now he has his own sandwich shop in St. John's. We'll take you inside.
Well, opening a restaurant is a gamble at the best of times. Opening a restaurant during a global pandemic when absolutely everything is up in the air? Well, that requires a whole new level of grit. Mike Boyd is the owner, operator, and head chef at Mickey's Sandwich Shop on Water Street in St. John's. Here's a look at his latest venture. There's a new sandwich shop on Water Street in St. John's, so we're gonna check it out. Let's go to Mickey's. Okay, Mike, you've worked all over the world. You're a gourmet chef. I've seen you plate some beautiful, stunning things. Why a sandwich shop? In all honesty, I think I find the same, if not more, satisfaction in making something like a sandwich than I do uh, doing like an elaborate caviar spread for a billionaire on their on their yacht. You know, it's it's uh, there's something about the simplicity of it that you can still apply the same sincerity, the same technique, the same experience. And I think St. John's really just needs one. It's it's a uh, it's something. It's just a good mar a good market for it, a good model for downtown, especially. Um, yeah, I think it's kind of ripe for the picking. What's, well, right now on the menu, or at least on the start, we're going to roll with a pickled herring sandwich. Whoa. So, yeah. Where is, it, where is the pickled herring from? Petty Harbor. There's a fisherman in Petty Harbor. So, uh, a couple days ago, I picked it up at around noon. It was out of the water like two hours before that, and then it was pickled within another two hours. So, you've cooked all over the world, and you've cooked for some, like, celebrities, right? And can you mention any of them? Uh, can't, okay, well, not really, no, there's like the non-disclosure agreements or confidential agreements, you, you kind of have to honor that. Just like um, one? Well, okay, so there's a lot of musicians, uh, a couple actors, uh, politicians, a president, an actual president, which is cool. Um, oh, there's a few like, <laughs> that aren't, well, aren't significant, but uh, uh, I cooked for Kim Mitchell's band manager. Uh, one time I was under the impression that I was cooking for Kenny Chesney, okay. so everyone on the boat was all kind of excited you know, he's a pretty big name. Uh, I knew nothing about him. My wife was a big fan, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna approach him for an autograph or something for my wife, so I should probably know a little bit about his music, or even country music. So like, um, I watched a documentary on country music, I started listening to Kenny Chesney's music, just, just to have some sort of talking point. Yeah. And, um, and a couple of other crew members did it as well. And the guy gets on the boat, and it's not Kenny Chesney. It's like it's like Robert Chesney, and he's a lawyer from England. So oh, that was a bit of a <laughs> town. Yeah, I, I, that was one I bragged about a lot because I just knew a lot of people here like Kenny Chesney. Yeah, yeah no. you're still sort of six degrees away. Yeah, you're just like yeah. that's close. Where should Andy go for food and fun? Send her a message. Food and fun at cbc.ca. Prime Minister has agreed to appear before the committee looking into the We Charity affair. But today it was the Minister of Finance who appeared and dropped a bombshell. Evan Dyer has the story. This appearance was always going to be a tough one for Bill Morneau, who already admitted he should have recused himself. But today he brought a piece of news that made things even tougher. About two trips his family made with WE in 2017 to Kenya and Ecuador. In recent days, our family has conducted a review of our personal records, and we found documentation to confirm our payment of expenses for these two trips including flight and personal hotel costs of approximately $52,000. However, we were unable to locate receipts for any expenses related to WE programming, including accommodation. This was to my surprise. Yesterday, I asked my assistant to reach out to the WE organization regarding these trips and for them to provide me with the amount of total expenses incurred. Today, I wrote a check in payment of $41,366. Ministers are not to be getting paid travel. Opposition members found the explanations difficult to accept. Isn't there someone in your office who would tell you, come on, minister, <laughs> these, are the, these are the rules, these, these, this is the law of the land. It applies to you as well. Morneau insisted it was all an oversight. 
I expected and always had intended to pay the full cost of these trips, and it was my responsibility to make sure that was done. Not doing so, even unknowingly, is not appropriate. I want to apologize for this error on my part. Who did you think was paying for these tens of thousands of dollars of luxurious expenses that you were enjoying? The list of benefits that we gave to Liberal politicians and their family members already included hundreds of thousands of dollars for Justin Trudeau's family members and jobs and endorsements for two of Morneau's daughters. Today, that list of benefits got even longer. And also today, the Prime Minister ended speculation by saying that he too will appear before the Finance Committee to answer questions about his relationship with we. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the Governor General's secretary is promising to improve the environment at Rideau Hall. This after CBC News spoke with 12 sources who say there's a culture of fear and harassment that starts at the top. Ashley Burke reports. I've spoken to even more former employees at Rideau Hall who say they left because of the harassment. And they're upset that the Governor General's office is saying that it's not the reality of working there. More than a dozen sources say Governor General Julie Payette berates, belittles, and publicly humiliates staff to the point where people were reduced to tears, went on leave, or left the office altogether. And our official secretary, Asunta De Lorenzo, is also accused of harassing employees, calling some lazy and incompetent. De Lorenzo sent an email to all Rideau Hall staff last night after CBC's story broke. She didn't deny the allegations, but calls the story troubling, to say the least. De Lorenzo said, I want you to know that I, along with the Governor General and the entire management team, am deeply committed to fostering a healthy work environment. Please rest assured that the well-being of our employees remains our priority. The email goes on to say that staff can contact their managers, the ombudsman, or human resources if they have complaints. But sources that CBC News spoke to said that they, there's a culture of fear at the office and it is difficult putting complaints in writing. They feel there's no recourse when their harassment is coming from the very top. Now, the NDP are also calling now for an independent investigation. The Prime Minister can show leadership. And will the Prime Minister show leadership and launch an independent investigation. Every Canadian has the right to a safe, secure workspace free from uh, harassment, and that is extremely important. That's why we move forward on June 22nd with uh, announcements on strengthening the oversight in federally regulated agencies and environments, including the public service. Experts say other than the Queen, Justin Trudeau is the only one who can raise concerns with Payette, but it's not clear yet what the government's going to do. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the federal court has ruled that Canada's safe third country agreement with the United States is invalid because it violates the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Under the agreement, asylum seekers at official border crossings are turned back and told to apply for asylum in the country where they first arrived. The agreement has come under intense scrutiny since the Trump administration in the United States began tightening asylum rules. Critics argue that the United States no longer qualifies as a safe country. The federal court judge has suspended her ruling for six months to give Parliament a chance to respond. The law remains in effect until then. Well, first there were dash cams and then many police forces started using body cams. Well, now in some parts of the United States, there's also the gun cam. With public responses uh, to officer-involved shootings, I really felt it was important to have that perspective of what the officer most likely can see and the best point of view to see that from is, is the barrel of the handgun. Guns equipped with the cameras mounted at the bottom of the barrel automatically record when the firearm is withdrawn from the holster. This California detachment 250 kilometers south of San Francisco started using them late last month and plans to pair them with body cameras. Critics note the device only records if the gun is drawn and fails to deliver the context of events leading up to that point. Well, dozens have died or are missing in Nepal following flooding and landslides in recent days due to heavy monsoon rainfall. This man was one of the lucky ones.
his attempt to ride his motorbike across a submerged roadway proved foolhardy. Observers were able to pluck him out of the rushing water and save his bike too. The monsoon floods have displaced 4 million people in Nepal, Bangladesh and India since May. Well, a dramatic rescue played out in southeastern France yesterday. Two young children escaped through the window of a burning apartment near Grenoble. They dropped three stories into the arms of a crowd of people. Two of the men who caught the kids suffered broken arms in the incident. The children, aged 3 and 10, were treated for smoke inhalation, along with 17 others. The cause of the fire is not yet known. Welcome back to Here and Now. There's a unique new business that's making tracks in New Brunswick. It offers some interesting companions for people who want to take strolls along the beach or walks in the woods. Llamas. CBC's Shane Fowler hit the trail to check out the experience. So 
originally, um, I had just Pearl and Luna, my two alpacas, and uh, they were under a year old, so they were smaller, and they fit my Mazda 3. So I would bring them in my car, bring them to the beach for a full leisure walks, and they would love to go in the water, take a dip, um, especially on those warm days. And I posted it on Facebook, and I've got so many people that sent me messages that they wanted to come with me or come visit. Then people just went crazy for it and everyone wanted to come and join me. So then I thought maybe it would be a good idea to have a business out of it. And these yeah. guys seem to be enjoying it. Oh, they do. They have lots of um, slow energy. <laughs> Say, what's it like being a, a llama and alpaca assistant? <laughs> it's definitely always uh, entertaining and uh, yeah, always something to do for sure. But uh, there's never a dull moment, so can't complain. Every year I do funny little haircuts with them. Uh, last year they were poodles, so this year we have a dinosaur. I really got an overwhelming amount of respond with uh, my new business. I've got over uh, a thousand shares on Facebook in just a few days um, and hundreds of messages to answer. Uh, so now uh, I'm gonna get some help to help me with the business and doing the hikes uh, because I wasn't expecting this to, to be as popular as it is and all within a few days. <laughs> so I still have my part-time job um, doing uh, aesthetics and permanent makeup. So I'll be doing that part-time in the winter and then this full-time in the summer months. This has really kind of gone way beyond your expectations. It really did, and I'm really happy with the way everything turned out. And I think part of it is because of the COVID. Uh, people are trying to find different things to do and, you know, stay in the province. So animals bring lots of joy to people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> What an unusual idea. I would love to do that. <laughs> well, moving on now, uh, beloved game show host Alex Trebek is celebrating his 80th birthday today, more than a year after being diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. With the love and support of my family and friends, and with the help of your prayers also, I plan to beat the low survival rate statistics for this disease. Trebek, who has been hosting Jeopardy since 1984, just released a memoir. In it, he says if current treatment for his illness is not successful, he'll likely stop medical intervention. Trebek was born in Sudbury, Ontario. He worked for the CBC, hosting television shows, covering sports and reading the news on air, and has won several Emmys for his work on Jeopardy. Let's have a look at uh, the weather recap right now before we leave you tonight. A lovely day coming tomorrow for most of the island. 25 degrees in St. John's, 24 in Marystown. Chance of uh, some afternoon showers for the Port of Basque area, 19 degrees there. That heat warning that's been in place for central and northeastern parts of the island, that is now over, but uh, still pretty warm uh, in those areas tomorrow. And uh, in Labrador, looking at 25 degrees in Cartwright with some showers, lots of showers in Nain as well expected, but uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, it's going to be a hot one there tomorrow with uh, sunshine and a high of 26 degrees. Well, that about wraps it up uh, for us tonight. Uh, if you're going to be watching tomorrow, we'll have an interesting chat uh, about the honeybee importation controversy that's been playing out lately in this province. I spoke with a beekeeper in the Isle of Man in the Irish Sea, so we'll find out why there's a total ban on honeybee imports there. That's tomorrow night. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Good night.